live. Four o'clock rock here on Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, we are here for our flagship show on energy, Hawaii, the state of clean energy with the Energy Policy Forum. And although you may not see Sharon Marie Waki right now, she'll be here soon. <laughs> our principal guests are Eric Gleason uh, of Next Era and Mike Britton um, of the uh, Director of Legislative Affairs for the IBEW Local 2060. Okay, and uh, the title of our show today, we'll explore this in greater detail, is Yes, Energy Means Jobs Too. Yes, it does. I agree. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> okay, but first, we have the Negawatt moment. Uh, and uh, we have Lisa Harmon here from Hawaii Energy. She's a trade ally specialist, and she's going to talk about a special uh, certification uh, program that you guys are doing. Yes. So Welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Jay. I'd like to let everybody know about a program that we are offering in conjunction with AEE, the Association of Energy Engineers. It's, we are providing a sub significant tuition subsidy for a certified energy auditor training. So that's going to take place on, in June, June 20th through the 22nd at the Sheraton Princess Kaiulani. And it would be applicable for um, people that are, you know, working or supporting a facility located in Hawaii, energy engineers, obviously, that do audits and want to delve deeper into get a professional certification. Okay, so I, I, I just come down. Is that it? Is it that simple? Uh, go to our website, hawaiienergy.com, under education and trainings, and we have a link there that gives more information on our website and a link to the to the um, sign up registration. Prerequisites. Um, what do I need to study or look at before I come down? Well, <laughs> you should be an, an engineer or have some sort of engineering or energy auditing background. That would be helpful because it is a technically focused program, but it looks at things like um, building envelope, lighting systems, air conditioning systems, heating, motors and drives, so all aspects of the energy being consumed in a building so that to do a thorough and professional audit, and this is a great professional certification. And I wanted to mention, too, that the U.S. Department of Energy just announced that the AEE's Certified Energy Auditor Program is recognized under the Better Buildings Workforce Guidelines Program. And this is the first um, energy auditor, auditor program to earn this recognition. So that's another accolade for yeah, this no, excellent great. training that we're helping. Is this going to cost team. me anything to come down and get certified? Um, only a $450 copay to cover the testing portion, but Hawaii Energy is subsidizing a significant ah, portion so of that. So that's where you come in. You Correct. are subsidizing the, the cost of the, the program and the certification. Correct. So for AEE members, the cost is $2,395. Hawaii Energy is subsidizing everything but the $450. If they're not an AEE member, it's $2,695. Okay. And what do I do with the certification exactly? Well. It's a great way to enhance your knowledge and be able to um, just better identify and prioritize energy projects in the field. And it's a, a great thing to add to your resume and, you know, just to help you every day in your job. In Are the there jobs world. out there uh, for uh, certified energy auditors? Um, there are, and I think as we move more and more along our path to renewable energy, you know, energy efficiency is such a huge part of it. So having people that are proficient in these types of skills that can really go through a building and identify these are the different, different types of things that we need to look at to identify these opportunities to be more efficient is always greatly needed. Now, you know our principal uh, guest tonight, Eric Leeson, president of Next Era uh, Energy Hawaii, and uh, Mike Britton, director of legislative affairs for IBEW, Local 12. 60. They now have a chance to comment on what you're suggesting. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, Jay, thank you for having me on the show. And uh, it sounds like a great program and also sounds like you're interested. So I think we may have found. Uh, I'm going to send you the uh, link, Jay. The you first can person. sign right off. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a practical engineer, an osmotic engineer. I get it by osmosis only. <laughs> One of these days. Mike, what do you think um, about this? You know, say, same with me. Thanks for bringing me on. And anytime I hear the word jobs, you know, my ears perk up, and I want to, I want to hear more about it. So. Send him something. Great. Yeah. I'll send you the link to sign <laughs> up. Visit HawaiiEnergy.com and go to our professional and educational page, and you'll find lots more information in the sign up. Thank you, protocol. Lisa. Lisa Harmon, Hawaii Energy. Thank you. Thanks we'll take for a short me. break, and we're going to switch. Thanks for coming. Okay. Back. Great. Thanks. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Reg Baker and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Business in Hawaii is a program that is positive stories about business in Hawaii. Uh, we're tired of hearing the negativity and why it's the wrong place to have a business. 
we talk about the positive reasons for having a business in Hawaii and, and how to be successful. We broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Justine Espiritu, and I am the co-host of Hawaii Farmers Series. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson, and we are live with you every Thursday at 4 p.m. at thinktechhawaii.com. And our show focuses on Hawaii's local food uh, community. We feature not only the farmers that are producing our food, but we also feature the supporters and other folks involved in the community that are trying to promote local agriculture. <laughs> Aloha, my name is Carl Campagna. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. You can see our show every Wednesday at noon at 12 p.m on thinktechhawaii.com, as well as visiting YouTube and finding the link for the show there. The show is also aired on OC16. We look forward to seeing you on the show. Uh, we have many wonderful guests, uh, including Joan Husted, Corey Rosenley, where we talk about the very important issues of education for our keiki. We look forward to seeing you there. Mahalo. <laughs> We're back. We're live with the 4 o'clock rock, Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And we have uh, Eric Gleason here, our principal guest one of our two principal guests. He's the president of Next Era Energy Hawaii, and Mike Britton, director of legislative affairs, IBEW Local 1260. And of course, my co-host, who has just appeared, uh, uh -huh. that's Sharon Moriwaki, co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Our discussion today is, yes, energy means jobs too. And that's really important, you know, because we're always interested in jobs, the economy. I mean, for a long time, ThinkTech was, um, you know, kind of urging people to do technology jobs. For the first 10 years of our existence, it was all about technology. And the question I put to you, I guess, is, is this, isn't this technology too? Isn't it really a continuum of the same kind of science and technology? The jobs that we would have, that we will have, that we hope to have around energy are tech jobs, aren't they? A lot of them, not all of them. But I think just about every job in the energy the business, at least as we see it, uh, has technologies changing, right? So all all the jobs are changing in some way. Um, you know, I think if you if you step back and you say, well, what is going on with energy in Hawaii right now? I think there there are a couple things. Um, one is the move to renewable energy. Ultimately, 100% renewable energy means tremendous investment in Hawaii, and mm -hmm. as part of that, local job creation. Okay, so instead of spending billions of dollars a year to bring in oil, which actually doesn't take a lot of people here in Hawaii to purchase the oil and bring it in. Mm -hmm. You're actually talking about investing in, in you know, productive assets, large or small, mm -hmm. probably both, um, which means local jobs, right? Whether it's designing them or building them or mm -hmm. operating and maintaining them or administering them or regulating them, um, plus community benefits. So. So there's a lot of investment that should create, will create jobs here in Hawaii over time. And then the other thing that's happening, and this is not just in Hawaii, it's, it's everywhere, is that the technology of energy is changing. So we're going through a period now, I think, you know, we're going through a rate of change in technology, in business models, in economics, in customer expectations that is, is reminiscent of our industry 100 years ago, when it was really first starting out. And, and the pace of change just keeps accelerating. And so, um, you know, what we see is that every job is, is impacted in, in good ways um, and more jobs are being created. Yeah. But something you said I'd like to follow up on, and that's the point about investment. You know, and, we, and we've done many, many shows and luncheon programs about the whole notion of uh, investment in Hawaii. We need to have investment come in. We need to have offshore investment from everywhere come in because you know, in order to have, correct me if I'm wrong, in order to have jobs, you have to have companies. And companies have to have investment in the companies. And that's how you create jobs. You don't snap your fingers. You don't pass a bill. You, you have investment in companies that hire people. Isn't that it? Well, I mean, government has jobs too, right? And, and the nonprofit sector. So I, I don't, we don't want to take, take away all, all jobs. Are, you know, lot, lots of room for lots of employers. But uh, I think certainly in energy, the private sector is, is the well, overwhelmingly the largest employer, whether it's the utility or, mm -hmm. um, you know, smaller companies, solar installers, um, whatever it may be. There's a lot of companies involved in it. 
but for sure, uh, all of this stuff costs money, and you can't create the jobs if you don't have access to the capital. That's true. It's going to take a lot of capital. Yeah. I guess the, the focus is on people in jobs saying, hey, I don't want to lose my job, rather than what is the workforce of the future? What, what do you plan for? If, if the technology is changing rapidly, how do you train up people so that they are there so good employees remain to do the jobs currently and up, that, that are changing and evolving quickly? Uh, uh, well, how do you do that? And maybe uh, I think if you right? look from the union's viewpoint and whether the technology is changing, advancing, it takes the workers understanding that we got to partner with the companies and kind of going back to what Jay said, without the company there's no job, at, at least when we're looking at the private industry. Um, so, so the union has to make the workers understand that. We have to partner with the company to get that training, to continue good jobs in this industry, whatever that next technology is, especially in a, you know, we're moving towards 100% renewable. Things are changing. So what is the challenge there? I mean, what do you see as the biggest challenge and how do we overcome that so that we all kind of, you know, rising ship, I mean, rising tides lift all ships. I mean, how does that all work together? And what are the biggest challenges and what can we do about it? I think building that, that partnership, um, getting both sides to understand that we have to work together, we're in it together, and without that partnership, we both fail. I mean, I th and I would add just, I think one of the things we've seen is um, working with employees, working with the union, also work just working with the employees, um, when they see the benefits of the technology, they get excited about mm -hmm. it, right? They need the training, but they need to understand why they're doing it, too. Mm -hmm. And so just to give one example, you know, in, in Florida, um, people who go out to, you know, fix problems in the distribution system, they have iPads now at, in, at Florida Power and Light. They have iPads that tell them whose, whose electricity mm -hmm. service is working and whose isn't. That's huge. You right? save That's so great. much time yeah. to and, do that. And, and it's, it allows them to see where the problems are, fix the problems quickly, mm -hmm. and then know that they've fixed them. And right, if somebody's still out, they can go address it. So now they're, they have mm -hmm. power in their hands because they have superior information. Yeah. And so once, you know, somebody has a tool like that in their hands, they can see that they're actually more effective at their job. Mm -hmm. Their time's not being wasted. They're doing, they're helping customers mm -hmm. out. And so that's, that's an example of, you don't just want to, you know, force technology on people, but help them see how this will really help you do your job. Yeah. You want to make their jobs easier, mm -hmm. really. And more effective. And more effective. It's all about efficiency. And people but I like, like to, to raise get the feedback that you're doing a good job, too. So the customers say, oh, yeah, you fixed my problem. So then you have really, a public you know, opinion, you know. Uh, you know, benefit on that, too. But I, I'd like to talk about, uh, you know, uh, the loop, the imbalance that you can have when you're trying to build a job force and j build an industry. So you start at this level, <clears throat> and you have X number of jobs, and you want to get up here. And you start at this level in terms of, uh, you know, um, the companies, the technology, uh, the workforce, the workforce. Uh, you start at this level and um, th they're, they're only so competent, they don't know about stuff. You've got to train them. Okay, so if you train them over here and there are no jobs over there, you're imbalanced. If you have a lot of jobs over here and they're not trained for them, you know, mm -hmm. you're, in, you're not imbalanced. And so you have to sort of, I think, I'm just throwing this out as a theory, you have to spiral up. Mm -hmm. You have to start somewhere, eat away at it, eat away at it, a stepladder kind of thing, and then you, you bring both sides of the equation up. So thoughts about that? How do you do that? How can we do that? What do you, where do you start? What, what foot do you put out first? I think if you keep the training more general, and maybe, I don't want to say overtrained, but um, for instance, a solar installer, you could train somebody to install solar panels or you could train an electrician. And when there's solar work, they can install solar panels, but maybe there's not solar work, they can do commercial or residential electrical work. And I think that kind of evens out the, the tides as they rise and fall as far as being, uh, having work available. The entrepreneurial creativity. Right. Right. It's like those guys in the solar business, you know, uh, they don't have enough jobs, so they do plumbing. You know, it's happening, you can see right. the newspaper. Yeah. So uh, how does that, um, I guess it goes back to what you're saying, Mike, about um, well, it takes a partnership with the employer and the workers. But how do how do you frame that in a way that you're escalating together, and this general training then leads to oh, we've got a specific need here, or there's a new technology here that you can flip into new arenas, but still with 
some basic competencies and what are those? So, so I think we already have a workforce that's trained. And a, a lot of times when we talk about training, or even what you hear out of the legislature is we need to train people, we need to create jobs here. We have thousands of people who have good jobs that, you know, maybe, maybe he's a technician at a power plant, maybe he's an electrician, maybe he's a machinist, and he probably has 90% of the skill you need to do some of these other things, to, to work on windmills, to work on so commercial solar systems. So I feel like instead of focusing on taking this new generation of workers and starting from scratch, we already have workers who we could train and give additional training and the new generation of workers could come in behind them. And these are good jobs. These are jobs that are, allow you to live in Hawaii and buy a house, take care of your family, you know, provide for your kids. They're not getting rich, but they're definitely living in Hawaii and not being forced to move away. And, and that's the union's goal. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, we took a, a trip. Uh, Sharon organized it, but I went on it. <laughs> uh, and the union took us around. It was mostly IBEW, but it was Dwight Takamini who was the director of labor at the time. And we all got in a little yellow school bus and we ran around from Union Hall to Union Hall. It was very interesting and, you know, show the training rooms and all the equipment and the facilities that you guys had in one union and another um, to try to build a, you know, a workforce. Mm -hmm. And it was not only energy, but energy was a big part of it. So what, what struck me, though, is that the unions were trying to offer a kind of graduated program. You take a young fellow out of, uh, or a girl, out of high school, right. and you train him a certain way. And you have that baseline training you guys are talking about. Uh, and then, uh, you know, as time goes by, you give him more training. So this young fellow is not so young anymore. He graduates up the ladder, right. and he becomes more competent. He, ostensibly, he gets more money, and he leaves room for, this, for somebody else, some other young person to come in and take that. So it's, it's, a, it's a career path. It's a yeah. career ladder. And I think the unions can do a lot. That meant they were talking about this. Right. Uh, can do a lot to make a career path. It's not just you're in the union, you stay there for life. That's what you do. Don't touch me. I'm in the union. Right. Stay there for life. It's actually a career path, and it and it feels really good to do that. Mm -hmm. Is that what's happening? Yeah, I mean, you can you can train. You can move up up the union ladder. You can move into management. Um, I, I think one of the benefits when you look at journeyman pre programs when they come up as apprentices is is your skill is portable. You don't have to stay in Hawaii. You can go to California, you can go to New York. I mean, you, you, can, you can move to Europe and your skill applies you know, across the country, yeah. especially in something like the utilities. Yeah. I'd like to talk about the article in this morning's paper uh, about uh, Hawaiian Electric. Mm -hmm. uh, and they come, you know, they're talking about their 30-year plan, which they didn't file yet, but they kind of gave us a glimpse of it. And they said they're going to file it in August. Well, they're recall. going to file the third revision of it okay so, so there was a there was a draft uh, I want to say maybe it was late February then on April 1st they filed their updated power supply improvement plan mm -hmm. and then they said there's some more stuff we want to do so we'll make another filing on August 1st okay so and that'll be uh, that's not the final is it I mean nothing well the final in this it's currently envisioned that it's the final but ultimately that's up to the Commission yeah right this is this is this all of this is being prepared and submitted at the at the request of the Commission yeah, I remember that. So what, what came out of it for me, just in the, just a broad outline of what's contemplated here is, uh, and the leading point was that uh, Hawaiian Electric is interested in an undersea cable, um, which I think is just grand, actually. Uh, I've always felt that was what we needed. In order to reach the goal, right, in 2045, right. You, you have to equalize among the islands. And, you know, one of the things they're talking about is undersea cable. One of the things they're talking about is wind. That's another big piece. And wind has been sort of, what shall I say, in irons, <laughs> in irons uh, for the past few years after, you know, the, um, the, the big wind project, you know, sort of slid off. Although the article mentioned that's still pending at the PUC. Um, storage, another one. Storage is also part of this plan. And finally, LNG as part of this plan, although there may be controversy on some of these things. That was, I think those are the points I get out of the article. And the question is, you know, the utility can actually shape the whole affair by focusing in its plan on these kinds of things. So if I have a plan, as approved, you know, that goes forward about cable, there's jobs around cable. Uh, wind, there's jobs around wind. We talked before about mm -hmm. there's a new technology in wind. Right. You know, maybe, you know, the union can help. In, in any event, you need, you need people who are trained in the technology right. of wind. Storage is certainly big technology. 
and LNG is, well, you know. So it seems to me that what the plan ultimately says and what gets approved is going to dictate the kinds of jobs that are going to be out there. So I think that's too strong. Um, and I, I want to correct a little bit Please. some of the things you said. But before we do that, let's take this opportunity and give you, the op give you a scoop. Okay. Because about a half hour ago, Hawaiian Electric filed with the PUC an application for LNG importation okay, okay. to Hawaii as well as, as, well as a um, replacement generation, new modernized replacement generation, Great. which they've talked about in the PSIP, but now they've actually filed the application. Great. So, um, you heard it here on Think Tank. <laughs> you did. Sure. Breaking news right here. The, the, the CNN of energy in Hawaii. <laughs> so, um, first of all, Hawaiian Electric hasn't said the cable is our plan. What, what they have said is, the analysis that has been done so far, and, and including, it wasn't just Hawaiian Electric's analysis, it was uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory um, did some consulting for them. And the analysis says, hey, we don't, we don't see a path to 100% renewable energy for Oahu using Oahu cited resources. Not mm -hmm. saying it's impossible and it'll never materialize, but as we sit here today, based on what we know, we don't see that path. And so to get Therefore, to get, mm -hmm. to get all of the Hawaiian electric companies to 100% renewables, Oahu's going to need something from off Oahu. Now, those, there are three options that they've identified. One is biofuels. You can import biofuels. Right? You can also produce them here, but in the scale that we're talking about, the expectation is you'd have to import them somewhere else. Uh, offshore wind is another uh, possibility. And by that, we're talking about floating platforms offshore Oahu with transmission cables suspended in the water column. It's a, it's a kind of a new technology that's developing with some developers out there that are, that are uh, pushing it. And then the third idea they've identified is the inner island cable and renewables on a neighbor island. And so what they've said is we need to do some more work, particularly on the latter two, to, to think about this some more. But as we sit here today, those are the options that we see. Yeah. So, so I think, and there's a lot of steps between where we are today, a plan, and uh, the jobs that you're talking about in those specific areas, they're, they're not going to be able to, the, the utility can't just dictate, we're going to do this or we're going to do that. They prepare these plans. They have to show the, the analysis that they've done, the rationale why it's the right thing for customers and the state to go down one path versus another. Then they have to put in an application like they just did on LNG. And then the commission looks at that individually. So. Uh, and then it has to get done, right? So, so, and that's where the jobs come in. So really the plan is just the first step that says, mm -hmm. here's what we know we need to get to, here's the different options we have, here's how we're thinking about it right now, and they'll get feedback from stakeholders and from the commission on that. Why do I feel it's time for you to talk about a Clean Energy Day in August? <laughs> this is what we want to do in Clean Energy Day. Stick it's a great opening for you, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> we do this. We want to. We want. So what we're doing is gathering information. In fact, the forum is meeting next week to look at the big picture issues and what are some specific actionable pathways into the future so that we can lead up to not 2045 and 100 percent, but at least a milestone of 2030 that's more realistic. And so these pathways are very important, but we also need to bring the community along in terms of understanding that, mm. and that's what we're looking toward August to do. So good that you have that's these great. plans out there and we can start discussing it and, and um, what the impacts will be for the community as well. It's perfect timing. You know, it's really yeah, it good. Is, yeah, good. Yeah. good news. August. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Time, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I make me, I'm, um, I'm two years into my electrical engineering degree at UH Manoa, and I'm a smart guy. I would like to figure out where I'm going in this life. I'd like to stay in Hawaii. I'd like to be in energy. It's all about energy for me. Uh, I'd like to sort of range on, you know, just take a look at these options that are under consideration. Uh, I'd like to, you know, take account of what uh, Lisa Harmon was telling you, you know, about the certific certification of the uh, uh, electric energy uh, auditor. Um, and I like to plan my courses and my career. So I don't know for sure. It's a moving target, for sure. But what do I do? What kind of analysis do I make so that I know I'm going to be one of uh, Robbie Melton at HTDC. She runs HTDC, 80 by 80,000. She's got this plan to have 80,000 people in the state <laughs> earning $80,000 in technology, and that includes energy. So how do I plan my path personally? 
knowing what we're talking about here today. But if we wait long enough, eighty thousand dollars won't be there. Sure. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, no, immediately, more immediately. <laughs> like four years or eight years at max. Yeah. <laughs> what do we do? What do we do if well, we're thinking of the career? I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure this is true of you too. Maybe you should too, Sharon. Uh, like. My career has never gone according to a plan. That's so true. the that's first true. thing I would say is forget having that's a plan, true. True. but if you're kind of roughly heading in a direction that you think there's a need for what you're, the education you're getting, then you're probably heading on the right path, and if you're interested yeah. in it. Now, I personally, I took one electrical engineering course, and <laughs> it was tough. So I, my, you know, my hat's off to that electrical engineer, you, to you, that you're studying it. But uh, I think, you know, firstly, w go where the need is, right? There's going to be a huge need for people in clean energy, renewable energy here in Hawaii. Hawaii is on the global cutting edge of integrating renewable and distributed energy on a grid. Yeah, the whole world's looking at Hawaii. So, mm -hmm. so this is a great place to be, to be doing that if you've got anything that's relevant to clean energy. And the other thing is that I, I think is exciting is it, it's so important to Hawaii. Right? It's not just like some academic exercise or it's kind of interesting, but nobody really cares. I mean, people really care about this issue. So it's really an opportunity mm -hmm. to make a huge difference for the state as well. Yeah. So Aloha, as, and as, the and as an intern, my name is Anu Hitzel, if I'm in and almost my last year and I'm looking to where to climate go, change how do I outrage. intern or you know, learn some on-the-job skills with my to find whatever solutions I learned in school? Climate problems is it facing people, going to the employer? Nations, or she's talking about you, Mike. I hope yeah. you yeah. enjoy me. Where do I I think it depends what kind of job you're looking at, right? Anything, anything, as Jay says, anything that can use, what kind of skills do I need? It's engineering. Aloha, my name is Richard Emery, job, host of Condo Insider. More than a third of Hawaii's class, population yeah. live in I mean, some form of I mean, it would be where, where you want to work, what industry you want to go into. Um, you know, some of my best friends are engineers, and I always tell them you need to spend some time with mechanics mm -hmm. so you understand their side of it, right? You make decisions that affect them. So I, I think it's always good to kind of expose yourself to whatever you want. I think one of the things Eric said is, Look at what you want to do, what you enjoy doing, and, and find out what they're doing out there. I mean, if you want to build a windmill, it's probably not going to happen in Hawaii. If you want to work on a windmill, that's something that will probably happen mm -hmm. in Hawaii. I mean, for an electrical engineer, it's probably you know, good to expose yourself to the utilities. And so, so I think you've got to do some research, too. I mean, like Eric said, my, my career never, mm -hmm. I would have never imagined yeah. I'd be working for a union um, <laughs> talking about utilities 20 years ago. So. Yeah, I would never imagine I'd be doing a video right. thing either. Right. <laughs> so how important is the union in this, in this decision process of mine? Do I need the union? Do I want the union? Should I relish the union or should I do something else without the union? So, so I think first you've got to know what the union does, right? Take a minute um, and tell us. We just organized, for example, uh, windmill technicians for Sun Edison mm -hmm. um, just this past week. If you look at the skill, we talked about the technology it takes and the skill level they have. They're highly skilled, they're highly trained, but their pay, I don't believe, is equal to where it should be as far as comparable jobs in this industry. That's our job when we negotiate contracts, to put them where they belong, not to ask for too much, not to settle for too little, but to find that balance that the company makes a profit, the worker gets treated fairly for what they do, and you know, it's kind of create a win-win, not to be cliche, but create that win-win environment that um, everybody's doing okay. Okay, well, we're going to take a one-minute environment here okay. for a break. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's Eric Leeson, Mike Britton, and Sharon Moriwaki here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Yes, energy means jobs, too. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham here with Think Tech Hawaii, and I invite you to watch my show, the Economy and You, each Wednesday at 3 o'clock um, here in Hawaii on OC16. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hitchell, and I host the show called Climate Change Beyond Outrage. We go beyond outrage to find solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. I hope you will join me here every Tuesday at 1 o'clock, we broadcast live from thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and bye-bye. Aloha. My name is Richard Emery, host of Condo Insider. More than a third of Hawaii's population live in some form of association. And our show is all about educating, 
board members and owners about their responsibilities and obligations and providing solutions for a great association. You can watch me live on Thursdays, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. each week. Aloha. For the next segment, so we'll let her do that on the air. What exactly do you want to talk about now? I think the future, the future for our workforce, for clean energy, and from your experience elsewhere, um, what does that mean to take a current workforce that is, is sort of the, the, the old culture needs to be revamped and look at the future? What will it take and, and what are the positives and some of the, the costs of doing that and how can we get there? What is that future we should all be kind of saying, oh yeah, I want to go there. You want to start? The future? So, the so future, you, you yeah. know what, whenever I have these conversations, one, one of the things that always stick in my head is we, we talk about green energy and green energy jobs. And when I talk to my members, I like, to, I like to use the term better energy because there's improvements we can make in fuel power plants. Burning oil, we can do it more efficiently. We can become better at our jobs. We can help the company in that way. We help the consumer and we help the environment. But the focus is always on, you know, lately, rooftop solar. That's not the only option out there. Commercial solar is a good thing. So if we're looking forward, I'd say what I'd like to see is, you know, if you want to live in Hawaii and you want to work in this industry, you can live and work here whether you're from here or you want to move from somewhere else to here and afford to raise your family here. I mean, I don't think that's anything unreasonable to ask. And yeah, yeah. that's basically the goal of any union, no matter what, what trade you're representing or what company you work with. So trades are, you know, as the, as the field gets more technological yeah. complex mm -hmm. and all that, your trades are going to have to get more technological complex. Right. And the uh, people that you graduate out of your training programs are going to have to be really akamai about how to handle the latest and greatest equipment. Right. So this is going to change the way the union works, too. It, it does. And, and, and so my background, I come out of aviation, right? And, and one of my grandfathers was in aviation. And he started working on DC-6s. I started working on 767s. I mean, he had to learn. He retired. We had 767s and 747s. So... We were union workers, but we trained. I mean, we understood that if United buys a new plane, you need to learn how to work on that plane. Yeah. You know, we went from cables to fly-by-wire, and I think you're seeing the same thing in, in the utility industry is mm -hmm. we're going from 1950 and 60 technology to now, 2015. Let's turn to that. Eric, it's really a, a wonderful question to put to you. I mean, you've seen um, you know, the, the changes in the utility industry, I mean, remarkable changes in the past few years. Only in the past few years, it's really been incredible all over the country. The business end of it, the technology end of it, the marketing end of it, it's all, it's all changed. And it's going to continue to change. Mm -hmm. And you can help us by, you know, telling us what the utility of the future is going to look like and where are the jobs, not only in the utility, but around the utility. What does it look like? Yeah, and I think this is the... Um Boy, I'll tell you, if I had a really good, short, punchy answer to that, I'd be on, I'd be on the lecture circuit. But uh, I, I think this is all kind of, this is how, this is how I was going to respond to the last question, too. I think one of the, one of the key points is, you know, one of the, the important changes that's taking place in the energy industry is it's not just about the utility anymore, right? So what happened is, in Hawaii, starting in the early 90s, and this was true nationwide, um, there was, you know, independent power producers came into the market, mm -hmm. and so they sold, they built power plants, and they sold that power to the utility. Actually, there's a long tradition of that in Hawaii, uh, due to the sugar plantations mm -hmm. and having power production there. Mm -hmm. But so, so, it's it's it is it isn't it's never been really true, or not for a long time, that the utility was the only player. But there were very few players. Now where we are with distributed energy, you got a whole bunch of players and a whole bunch of mm -hmm. different kinds of jobs that weren't there before, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and that's evolving, right? Even, in, even amongst, let's say, rooftop solar companies, it's a very topsy-turvy industry. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, and, and that's partly because the technology, the business models, the regulatory um, regimes are changing as well and so it's very dynamic and that's all part of the ecosystem that we're all operating in trying ultimately to give customers the best choices for energy so i guess i would simply say that the pace of change it, in the 20 plus years i've been in the industry it's it's what makes it such an interesting industry is it it keeps changing it never gets boring and it feels like the pace of change is just increasing the technological options 
the customer engagement uh, mm -hmm. is continues to change. And now when you combine that with mm -hmm. Hawaii's very aggressive, appropriately aggressive policy goals, it means there's just going to be a, a lot of really interesting things for people to do in energy here in Hawaii. I don't know what all those things are. <laughs> well, how can you make it not so daunting and overwhelming, but, you know, sort of like, okay, I can see my way forward because this is really exciting and we're going to do really good and, you know, all, it, you know, have a positive spin to it rather than, my God, <laughs> oh, dear, the headlines. Well, I, look, I'm just going to say really simply, if you don't like change, don't go in the energy industry in Hawaii. <laughs> Seriously, you got to have a certain comfort level with change because it's changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's going to be a, for for people who can who can deal with that um, you know dynamic. It's going to be a really cool place to be working because what we're doing is important and the opportunities are increasing. So what it's kind changing of support? Fast. Yeah. So what kind of support can you give to people who like change but you know need to be trained or need <clears throat> to have the opportunity to make mistakes and not get fired? You know, so that yeah. that there is this kind of. You need to have almost an environment to support change. So we had a, our, our previous CEO at Next Air Energy had a saying that, that I try to remember, which is, you know, I don't mind people making mistakes. I just wish they wouldn't keep making the same ones. <laughs> so, so that's kind of our approach is that, you know, we, you, you're going to, yeah. when an environment of change, you have to be prepared. You have to be willing to fail from time right. to time, right? right. Otherwise, you're, otherwise, you're being too risk averse. And that's actually yeah. one of the cultural changes that the utility is going through now. Um, you, know, you obviously don't want to fail more than is necessary, but you have to be prepared to, to take some risk, prudent risks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that's part of what's going on. But uh, I think yeah. in terms of the training itself, you know, I could, speaking for our company, um, I know Hawaiian Electric um, and the IBW mm -hmm. place a premium on training. In our company, we have something called Next Era Energy University. Oh. Uh, different, different areas of the company have set up their own colleges within Next Era oh. Energy. Mm -hmm. um, we have partnerships with, uh, with community colleges around the country. Um, lots what of are internships. The, what, are the courses? Is it, what kind of courses? So, do you have so you, ev everything from career development to learning accounting, if, you know, God bless you. You <laughs> want to learn accounting. To, <laughs> oh, right. Project, wants to be trained. No, pro project management, hmm. um, yeah. so, something called Six Sigma, you know, improving your processes. So those kind of generically applicable things to uh, I'm going to I want to go to the College of Power Systems to learn more about some of the electrical engineering that I never got a chance to go to college. <laughs> it's and learn. not too late. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, I, that's, that's, that's uh, this very week, uh, Think Tech is playing a, a, its a weekly movie on OC16. And this one deals with Hawaiian Telecom University. They've been doing that for seven years, actually, but it's getting much better and better every year. And they did it where? At the convention center. And they invited like everybody in the telecom and tech field to come down. And they brought in national speakers on technology. I mean, big names, big companies. Uh, Microsoft was there, a number of others. And um, you know what, what they're doing, and, and, they, and they have uh, innovators and uh, entrepreneurs uh, talking about their stuff. And so everybody is all excited about the, about the new technology around the old telecom. It's really interesting to see them mm. make this kind of transition. They're really into change. They, try, they know they have to change. You can't do dial tone anymore. That doesn't work. You know, but you can do a lot of other things they're doing. And I, and I can see that uh, what NextEra and NextEra University is doing is the kind of thing could, should happen here in energy. I mean, it's that same kind of university expo kind of thing where you bring everybody together and they all, you know, compare notes on their ideas and their, you know, business models. And, and lo and behold, you have an industry of people who are thinking day and night about how to make it better and how to raise all the boats with uh, the new technology. And, you know, one of the things, I mean, Hawaiian Electric is involved in this thing with uh, the uh, incubator over there with Dawn uh, Energy Accelerator, yeah. Accelerator. I mean, that's just an example of what could happen on a larger scale. That's just the beginning, I think. Uh, we could have entrepreneurial activity, <laughs> startups even, yeah. in figuring out some of these software issues. And I think some of the know-how that is developed here in Hawaii ultimately can can potentially be export. That was my next question. <laughs> Gee, and we didn't rehearse this. <laughs> export. If That's you good. develop a body of trained people and, and special knowledge and entrepreneurial, you know, innovators, 
then you have something you can export. Does this happen on the mainland? Well, no, nobody's where Hawaii is, right? <laughs> no, but I, I, so I think, you know, on the one hand, uh, it's probably a little unrealistic to think that, you know, Hawaii's going to be the Silicon Valley of en energy because the Silicon Valley actually is the Silicon Valley of, of energy. Um, so maybe, maybe the, the R&D is not going to be here, but the actual ap application of early stage technologies, the, beds. The, te the, the clean mm -hmm. energy test bed that, mm -hmm. that people like mm -hmm. to talk about here, that the energy accelerator is involved in, makes a ton of sense here. And just, just I, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not smart enough to know all, all the ways that we're going to learn to do things here that are going to be applicable in other places. And when I say we, I mean the energy industry broadly. I'm not just talking about Hawaiian Electric and Nextera. But there's bound to be some. And, you know, for example, the Energy Accelerator is now um, I'm active in New Zealand and probably other places I'm not mm, aware of. Great. So, so mm -hmm. they're looking at how can, we, how can they take the, the model they've mm -hmm. developed uh, in, in sponsoring and, and um, encouraging entrepreneurialism, mm -hmm. how, can they, how can they export that model elsewhere? You know, this, this all tells me that um, it's really big. The jobs are big, the future is big, the technology is big, the, all of that entrepreneurial activity is big. Why? Because look at all the energy. It's all around us. Look at all the efficiency. It's all around us. These issues mm -hmm. defy our society, whether you like it or not. You know, the, the uh, Alan Lloyd, who was an engineer with one for a long time, you know, he wrote a piece for the, the newspaper uh, yesterday, I think it was. They said, don't forget, we've got to keep the lights on. He always says that. <laughs> I say that, too. Yeah. Don't forget. It's an inconvenient truth. <laughs> <laughs> we like to say, don't forget, we do keep the lights on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, but, but the point is, though, as we go forward, this society, as every society, at least in this country, uh, energy is going to be, see if you agree with me, energy is going to be more important. It's going to have a greater effect. It's going to be a more important industry. These jobs, this body of expertise is going to be more important to the community than it is now. I think yes and no, okay? I think it's going to be more important in good ways if we do a good job at this, which I'm very hopeful that we will. It's going to be less important in a way that is good, which is it should be a smaller portion of the economy in terms of mm -hmm. the, because right now, efficient. because it's more efficient because we get off of oil, right? Mm -hmm. So right now, Hawaiian Electric's collecting two to three billion dollars a year from customers, depending on where oil prices are, right, across the, across five islands. So you'd like that number to go down, go down ideally, or at least not be growing right, faster right, than right, the right. economy. You want it to be a smaller portion of the economy. Hawaiian Electric is a huge company in this state when you look at it in the context of other states and other utility companies because, because the prices are so high, right? So I'd like to see it become a smaller part of the economy, but a bigger part of the jobs, mm -hmm. right? The energy sector should be a bigger part of the jobs, but utility bills should be a smaller part yeah. of the economy. The kids here. Uh, and I'd say as we become better, that'll be true. Yeah. I mean, it could shrink jobs, but they could be better jobs. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're about, we're about uh, done, and before Sharon gets to close, I want to <laughs> ask you guys to give your message. Uh, let's see, that, we'll, that, we'll that's camera first. two over there. Tell and, the world. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, you have to imagine there's a picture of a bunch of kids drinking at a bar after hours. And uh, what, what do you say to them about this whole subject of energy and jobs and the future of Hawaii? What do you say to them? Look um, at the camera. And tell so, so I'd say uh, it's definitely the future. I think I think to deny it is is crazy. At the same time, you know, to, to kind of keep it short and sweet, I don't think we have to choose between clean energy jobs and good jobs. <laughs> right. I'd say, look, everything, everything we're working on for clean energy transformation in this state over the coming 20, 30 years is really for the future generations, and so. Uh, hopefully you're going to be, some of you are going to be part of the clean energy workforce, but um, all of you are going to be benefiting from it, and, and you're really what we're working for. Great. Great. Sharon? I want to thank Eric and Mike, because this <laughs> is the start of a really good conversation, because we've kept on talking about kind of the macro things and not where it really leads, is a better economy, more jobs, keeping our kids home, mm -hmm. uh, with, with some meaningful jobs for the future. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, thank you, Eric Leeson. Thank you, Mike. It's been a great discussion. Aloha. We'll do Aloha. it again. Aloha. All right. Look forward to it. <laughs>